we are in a series with a very unique name. It's called Gain to Give. And for the last two weeks, we've been talking about how God wants us to have Sabbath in our lives, times of rest, and that we often program ourselves right to the very top of our abilities, and then we can understand why we are imploding and falling apart in terms of our time and our finances and our relationships. And so we've talked about that picture of holding your cup up to God and to have space in your life for worship and space for rest and space for rebuilding energy. But the purpose of all of those things is not to just give you a better life. The purpose of those things is so that you can see God's abundance in your life so that you can become generous. So we're switching in the series, we're switching this week to now talking about consistent generosity. That this is God's plan for us and we're going to take kind of a 30,000 foot view of why does God give you what he gives you? What is the way that we are to look at your process, your time, your possessions, and your money. So, uh, spoiler alert, we are going to talk about something touchy. We're going to talk about money, and we don't take an offering here, and we don't emphasize that, but we believe, listen carefully, that as you mature in your discipleship and following of Jesus, it has to affect your wallet and your schedule. That if you don't have a spirituality that changes the way that you handle your time and your money, then you have a very shallow spirituality. So we want to talk about what is God's perspective on it, but I want to ask you a question that I think you'll find very interesting. I say this to couples who are in premarital counseling, which may be an exercise in frustration because usually they're not listening that well at that point in time. They already think we can talk about anything, it's all going to be good. And uh, I'm hoping to give them some gems that maybe they can utilize a little later. But the perspective is the reason that people have so many conflicts about money and the reason why when we talk about money we get such an emotional reaction is because money is a symbol. So I have, I have a dollar here. It's not a lot of big money. Probably dollars go to church a lot anyway, so we have got him here. But you know what this is worth? No, it's worth less than a penny. It's a piece of paper. You can't eat it. It doesn't keep you warm. It's absolutely worthless, except as a symbol of something. And we've mutually agreed that it's going to represent a dollar, whatever in the world that is. But I want you to see that it also represents something different for each of us. For some people, it's about security. That I have money and I put it in the bank or I've got money coming in and because I have X number of dollars, I can feel secure. So here's a tricky question for you. How much money does it take before you actually have security? Exact the answer. It's always a little more because I never actually get security from money. And then for some people, it's about if I have money, then I don't have to share. I don't have to do things with other people. I don't have to be dependent. I can do what I want and I can have control of my life for myself. So it's a lot about control. For some people, it's a lot about freedom. If I have money, I don't have to wait. I don't have to save up. I don't have to, I can do what I want anytime I want. So it's about freedom. For some people, it's about status, style. If I have enough money, I can wear the right brand of clothing. I can have the certain kind of house. I can have the right car. And that makes me feel good about myself. And if we're honest, it maybe it makes me feel better than whoever else I'm comparing to. And, and so, have you ever noticed how easy it is to get a raise and go up in lifestyle and how hard it is to go down in lifestyle? It's part of it because it affects our identity of how we see ourselves. For some people, it's just about luxury and pleasure. If I have money, I can buy coffee every morning. I can buy a fishing boat. I can, I can do things to, to fund my, my toys and my fun. And then I put a question mark here because I think there are some other things, maybe not quite as larger categories. For some people, I find that those who seem to have quite a bit of money, it's often just a way of keeping score. You ever think about that? That money isn't about how do I get enough to eat. That money is about did I win in that deal or did I lose? Am I winning in my life, getting ahead, like stocking up more for the future? 
And sometimes I think if we're honest, it's about winning over somebody else. I won and you lost. That's what I was looking for. And money's the way to make that count. So here's my insight. If you have a husband and wife who see money very differently, they will never come to the same mind about money until they start talking about how it's about different values. So money represents things that we value. It represents things that are on our heart. And so we're going to talk about what Jesus said about the treasure in our heart. But we're going to take a big picture, and we're going to talk about, if you see over on the right side of your sheet there, the Old Testament, which is the time before Jesus, is signified by the OT. The NT is the New Testament, that is the time of Jesus' life, and also after he was crucified and raised from the dead and went back to heaven. So we are New Testament believers, and I find that a lot of people, especially newer believers, they know almost nothing about the Old Testament. And the truth is, is that we are not under the Old Testament. We don't have to keep all those laws and regulations, as we talked about in Sabbath, but we are clearly founded on it. That the New Testament is written with a hope and that you would understand what the Old Testament was about. It's the context by which we understand it. So I'm going to try to help you as we go back and forth between the ways that these same principles play out in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So the first premise that's all the way through the Scripture is God provides for our needs. He promises He will take care of His people. And that's true in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I want to show you kind of a unique example. It may be a verse that you're unfamiliar with, but when God was first starting the nation of Israel, he picked a guy named Abraham, and he gave him some incredible promises, like you're going to have descendants like the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. And, you know, Abraham saying, well, that'd be nice. Let's start with one. I don't even have a kid yet. And God kept making him promises. Listen, for 25 years between the first promise and when that child finally came, and in the meantime, he kept, excuse me, kept telling him more about the future, listen, so he would trust that God was going to keep his word and so that he would know that God was paying attention. So here's the promise that he made. He says, the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. Now, first of all, when you're telling somebody how they're going to be a great nation, and you tell them 400 of those years are going to be in slavery, that might be like a, whoo, that's not too exciting. But I hadn't realized till a few years ago, slavery was part of God's provision. So God meets our needs, but not always like we want Him to. And part of the reason I believe that God put the Israelites in Egypt is because if they had stayed in Canaan with only 70 people and trying to clear a little spot, they would have been at, at war with all the little city-states around there, all the other people groups, and it would have been a constant battle. And so God took them down to Egypt, and for 400 years they were behind the biggest army in the world, the Egyptian army. And they didn't have to fight. And because of that, they grew from 70 people to an estimated somewhere close to 3 million. And they did that without losing all their young men to battle, without being in constant conflict. So God provided for them even though they were slaves. And then he gives this very enigmatic promise. He says, afterward, they're going to come out with great possessions. Now, if you read that for the first time, you'd think, they're slaves for 400 years and they got rich doing that? How in the world is that going to work? And God says, this is 500 years before it actually happened. Here's what I'm going to do. And God is saying to us all the time, I'm bigger than you, I care about you, and I know what I'm doing. You think we have a hard time believing that? Yeah, especially when our life doesn't go as we have prescribed it. And God says, I'm bigger than you, <laughs> I care about you, and I know what's going to happen. And if you believe those things, then you begin to trust God. So what happened here? 500 years later, God calls a guy named Moses, and he says, I want you to go down and deliver my people from Egypt. And God puts on this incredible show of 10 plagues by which he not only 
shows himself more powerful than Pharaoh. He tweaks the nose of every one of the gods of Egypt. And then he brings them out, and look at this verse. The Israelites did as Moses instructed, and they asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. And the Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people. I think they were scared out of their minds because of the plagues. And they gave them what they asked for, so they plundered the Egyptians. Now, they already had flocks and herds, but I want you to pay attention to this. They were slaves. Do you think they had a lot of gold and silver before that? No, they probably had nothing but subsistence living. And so God gives them this unearned, incredible gift. Now, here's the question I had never really thought through. Where does that gold go? And I'm going to give you a little challenge. In the devotions this week, I believe you'll see two different places where that gold goes, and I think it's an amazing lesson, but I'm not going to tell you until next week. So do some study this week and come back and see if you've already got it figured out. So God gives them a whole bunch of gold and silver. Notice that specifically. Is it the same in the New Testament? Does God promise that he's going to take care of us? That he has a different perspective than we do? In fact, Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, he makes this very simple statement that says, God looks at our stuff completely differently than we do. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus says, as he starts them off, he says, I want you to understand how I see things. Our perspective is I want to get money, I want to get stuff, I want to have things so that I can own them, so I can control them, so that I can use them, and we place a high value on what we gather. And God says, I want to tell you what happens to it. You're going to lose it. You can't hang on to it. It's going to get stolen. It's going to get eaten. Have you noticed that the more stuff you have, the more work it takes to take care of it? Yeah. I'm at the stage of life where I go by garage sales, and instead of thinking, oh, awesome, I can get that, I think, I should sell mine of that too. I should have a garage sale. Because the more you have, the more you store, the more you have to take care of, the more breakdowns, the more frustration it is. And God says, the opposite way of looking at it, listen carefully, is you only keep what you give away. That's weird thinking, isn't it? That what you try so hard to hang on to, you will inevitably lose. And then he says, but if you store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, it's inviolate. You can never lose it. So God, first of all, says the way you look at stuff is completely backwards. That what you think is an, is an advantage for you is actually something you can't hang on to. And then he goes deeper. He says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Let me say it very succinctly. Your spiritual life is evidenced by how you handle your finances and your time. That if it doesn't make a difference how you operate, in fact, he goes on and he says this, this statement, so do not worry saying what should we eat or what should we drink or what should we wear for the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. In other words, what distinguishes how you live your life from the guy that lives next door to you that's an atheist. And if our way of handling our time and our stuff is the same, that's a bad way to be. And in Matthew 6, if you don't have it open already, he, he gives him a little bit of lead-in too in verse 25. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And then he asks this question, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? <laughs> and I think the answer to that is no, you can reduce it by a lot by worrying, but you can't add it. And he uses this illustration. He says, look around you. Look how I take care of other things I care about. And then he asks that question, 
don't you think you're more valuable? Or maybe if I lean in a little more, he says, don't you believe I care about you? And I think at the essence of our trust is do we believe that God cares about us? And then Jesus ends with this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things... And he's speaking specifically of enough to eat and enough to wear. And and I do have a little warning for you. God's idea of what you need and your idea of what you need may be different. Because our idea of what I need gets inflated pretty easily, doesn't it? Especially when the neighbors get a new car or when somebody else gets something. It's like all of a sudden that becomes a need. And I think we've got the wrong first letters. It's a greed probably more than a need. So God promises he'll take care of us. He doesn't promise it will be in the manner to which we are accustomed. But here's the deep question about our finances, is do you trust him? And I think that's a great place for you to wrestle a little bit, saying, how much do I trust God? And I think it's in those same areas. Do I trust him to be my security? Do I trust Him to give me contentment with what I have instead of always wanting more? Do I trust Him to have a purpose for my life? Is my life come from living out a meaningful life with God or does it come through having enough toys and entertaining myself to death? And I think you begin to see that all the things you want from money really come from God. And that money is a terrible master And it is a terrible companion in terms of trying to get the meaning of your life from that. And our world is going crazy over it. You are being bombarded with a materialistic message which says, the thing that would really make your life is if you win the lottery. And you know they've done historical studies. Everybody who's won the lottery has got a destroyed life. Why? Because money does not give you what you need. So first of all, in the New Testament, he says, I want you to think differently about it, and I want you to trust me just as I did tell you in the Old Testament. God not only took care of the nation of Israel as they came out of Egypt, he provided manna, daily bread. He provided quail when they needed meat. He provided water from the rock. He he provided everything, but they had to be dependent on him every day. He didn't give them all they needed for 40 years. He gave them what they needed for today. In fact, I think that's what the Lord's Prayer comes in. Give us today our... Yeah, and we want to pray for our yearly and annual income, right? And he says, it's your daily bread that I'm interested in supplying. So what did God want them to do with what he gave them? In the Old Testament, there was a system we called the tithe system, which is because it was built on the idea that everything that they had, everything that they got from their land, everything they got from their animals, everything that they were able to earn, they were to give 10% of it to God. So here's a simple verse out of the many that we could show you. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. In fact, the way they talked about it is, this is the sacred portion. Be sure you don't keep it in your house because this part belongs to God and you don't want to hang on to it. So they had this very simple idea that was clear and concise and everybody could know whether they had done it or not, which was, this belongs to God. And so this week we're talking about your regular giving and this was their regular style. Now, that was a process, I think the same thing that we did with our kids. I think God was doing with his kids what we did with our kids. When they got an allowance of a dollar, we had a jar for this is what the 10 cents you give to God, and this is the 10 cents you put in for savings. College, we said pretty quickly, right? Was that because God needed a dime? No, it's because we're trying to train them to have a different way of thinking about their resources and about their finances. And I think God did exactly the same with the Old Testament system. And what was the purpose of it? What happened to the 10% they gave? You may not even understand this, but I think it's a good foundation for what God does with our finances. The first part of it was to provide for their spiritual leaders. It was to give a tribe, there was 12 tribes, and one of the tribes were called Levites, sons of Levi. 
and they were charged with a very special responsibility. When the nation of Israel came into the land of Canaan and they were all given land, the Levites got zero land. They were given 20 cities scattered throughout the country, and they were to be the, the tribe that kept reminding people to worship God. They were supposed to be keepers of the word and to teaching the word. They were supposed to be a city of refuge for those who needed, who needed rescuing. They were supposed to be those who called the whole nation to worship God. And they survived not by the land. They survived on the tribes' tithes. The other 11 tribes gave to God, and then God channeled that to those spiritual leaders. And then the Levites gave a tithe, and that went to the priesthood. Aaron, Moses' brother, and all of his children who were priests, they did the sacrificing and the worship of the temple, and they were supplied by the Levites, and they in turn gave that towards several things, one of which the second thing is that God used the tithes to provide this place of worship. And the first one was a, a mobile worship center called the Tabernacle, and it's I, I joke about saying this is what we're doing down in Myrtle Creek. We've got a mobile worship center that we set up every week and we take down every week. And every time they had to move, they had to take this down, so it had to be mobile. And that was called the Tabernacle. And then the second place, when they finally got to Jerusalem, when they got to Israel, they built a place on Mount Moriah, and it was the center where God says, I'm going to make my name dwell there. And it's interesting, if you go to Israel today, a small portion of that foundation is there called the Wailing Wall. And that's where people from all over the world come because somehow God's name is still there. And they used the gifts that people gave, the tithes were to go to help the ministry center there. And then the last thing is that they were also giving, and the, the Levites particularly were supposed to be helping those who were widows and orphans and those who had... Um, specific kinds of needs. So God had a full plan, but I want you to see that his desire, listen carefully, was he wanted to pour into them and have them generously pour into others as a sign of the greatness of God. He wanted them to be a demonstration of how good God is. And so our belief is that now you're in the New Testament, we're no longer under the tithe system, we are under what's called grace giving. That as God gives to you his spiritual gifts, as he gives to you finances, as he gives to you health and time and energy, that our joy and our desire is to give back to God and to give to others, we want to, be, to have a spirit of generosity. And what happens is the more you grow spiritually, the more that becomes what you really believe and what you really do. So again, I say, how you handle your time and your finances has to do with where your heart is and where your maturity level is. So we've got a story for you uh, of a guy who's on our, our staff at this point, but a good friend of mine, Craig. So this is Craig, and he is not only a good friend of mine, we were neighbors for years, and he's mm. been coming to the church now for 20 years, yep. and now he's our missions pastor here on staff. And he, he was sharing some things with us about how God had worked in his heart um, over the 20 years that God's had you here. Why don't you share a little bit about how God worked in your heart related to giving? Yeah, when I, so I grew up in the Catholic Church, and so, you know, part of the, the giving at, at the church there was that they'd pass the plate. And I remember my dad, he would always go in and write a check and bring that check, and, and oftentimes I'd get to place it in the basket. Yeah. And, uh, and so I came to family church, and that wasn't happening. And I thought, what's going on? They, they don't pass the plate here. Huh, that's cool, you know. And so that's kind of what I just was like, I wonder how they... I'm, I'm scot-free now. Yeah, yeah, this is good. So in fact, I didn't give for a long time. I was like, well, they, they don't do that. That's cool. And of course, I was wrestling with coming to church anyways. And, and then I started to, to grow in my attendance. But there's some changes and that started happening. And I think sometimes people feel like that. It's like I'm writing a check, and it's kind of like I'm paying for a show or a movie or a dinner or something. It's like I'm paying for the experience, and if I don't show up, 
I don't give, and if I do show up, I give. Yeah. So yeah. it's a whole different way of thinking. So as you were growing spiritually and as you got challenged about giving, talk a little bit about how that changed in you. Yeah, it's funny because you mentioned that, and that was my first really time in my life was here. I started giving. And I did give with the, the mindset, I should at least pay for the lighting. I mean, come on. Yeah. Or at yeah. least the chair I'm sitting in. And then, but as I grew spiritually, God was really pressing in my heart. I mean, as I read scripture and I saw uh, through the Old Testament, the commandment to give. And then through the New Testament, I saw generosity that was an outflowing of, of love for God. I was really challenged to start thinking about, wow, the, the pastors, they, they need to provide for their family. And I, and I encouraged by them. Mm. And then also there was mission work going on. And, and, and that work, well, I wasn't going to ever necessarily directly see at that time. And, but they need help. And yeah. I started to grow in that. Ultimately, it was because I was challenged to say, well, look what God is giving me. How am I investing that? But it's hard when you've got a lot of other bills going and you've got a lot of other financial pressures. How, how did you deal with that? Yeah, I think that was, you know, the number that's always placed out there oftentimes from Old Testament is the, the concept of a 10% tithe, right? Right, right? And man, I thought 10% there's no way. Like only rich people could give 10%. And so I started giving, and that was always a marker. I thought, I hope someday that I can be that generous <laughs> to God, which is a funny idea. And so I started giving and, and increasing my giving and challenging myself as I was reading Scripture and being challenged here. And so I, I've increased my giving, and we reached a point where uh, we had doctor bills coming in. You know, kids come with doctor bills, I think. That's part of the package. <laughs> Lots of them. Yeah, and so it was an it, kind of an increased amount of bills had come in. And I remember specifically, I had come to a place in my giving where the first thing I do is I write a check to God. So you're giving regularly by yeah, this time. Yeah, by this time a regular giver. Um, you know, my percentages were increasing. I don't want to flaunt or decrease, but that's just where I was at. I was giving regularly. I felt like I was giving semi-sacrificially. and But the money I was going to give to the church could have paid for that doctor bill for the month. Yeah, yeah. And I thought... I wrestled with God, and I said, okay, God, I'm going to give this to the, to the bill, okay? I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to give to you this month. And so I wrote the, the check and sent it off, and I paid that doctor bill. And, and that whole month I wrestled. I just was like, man, did I really trust God? Like, do I trust him enough that even when I have bills, that he'll still continue to provide and, and continue to, to spiritually mature me, basically? Yeah. Well, that whole month I realized I didn't stop drinking coffee. I didn't stop having meals. And at the, the end Holy of the Spirit's month. The Holy Spirit's kind of pointing out. Yeah, he's like, all, uh, all you, know, you know, you, there was money. There was money there. And the work that I, that I want you to invest in is going to far outlast even the doctor care you received. Yeah. And so that next month it came and it was time to write that check and, and give my tithe. And I said, no, God, I, I'm going to give to you and I trust you. And the doctor bills, by the way, were still coming. Yeah. Uh, they weren't any less <laughs> uh, other than the one I had paid off. And so I gave to God. And, uh, and then I paid my doctor bill, and you know what? We made it through the month. Wow. And it was a real awareness that God, I think God was showing me, when you give, give because you love me. And as I've grown in my walk, I think that is the outpouring, is my giving is not because I want lights on, even though that's important, or I want the pastor paid for, or I want the missionary supported. It's because God has given so much. How could I not? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's... So you talked a little bit earlier about the 10% and that, that idea that that's kind of a upper limit. That's kind of a thing to uh, you know, shoot for because that's kind of a high giving line. Yeah. You said there was something kind of that happened to you recently. Yeah, it's funny how God uses uh, just circumstances and then challenges your thinking. And really, I mean, I've I'm, I'm been trying to challenge myself that I increase my giving at least 1% every year with the goal I'd love to be more than 50% someday in my life. Wouldn't that yeah, be awesome? That'd be awesome. And above. But I, I'm on the phone, the, the phone company I was having problems with that, that I was working with. And so to sort of calm down the situation and they, were, they knew they were going to lose me. So I got somebody on the phone who said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do is we'd like to take 10% off your bill. And my first reaction, of course I was, yeah, great. But the first thing in my head was, are you kidding me? 10%, <laughs> that's it. That's all you'll give. That is that is nothing. On this bill, that's like eight, six, eight dollars. <laughs> that's all you're going to do after all the frustration we've dealt with. And I hung up and I still have that carrier. But it wasn't about a day later when I just 
started talking about that in my mind, and I think Holy Spirit was talking, and, I th- and uh, 10%. It's funny how when a 10% discount is a joke, but a giving of 10% is huge. I was really, really challenged with that thought. Uh, that 10%. is awesome. That is awesome. Thank yeah. you, Craig, for sharing your journey and sharing some yeah. good challenges with us. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> 10%, that's nothing. Depends on whether it's coming in or going out, right? So, so what's the foundation and what's the process for this idea of grace giving? And, and it comes out of this sense of partnership that God is involved in my finances. And I think we've got an idea that we're involved in it, but you know how many ways in which God impacts your finances? And I hope you're beginning to see this. He goes on in the New Testament, he says, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. Going back to that treasure and heart thing, And then he says, not reluctantly or under compulsion, not because somebody guilts you into it or because somebody pressures you. He said, because God loves a cheerful giver. You know why? Because God is a cheerful giver. He enjoys, you know, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. And I don't know that we believe that. But God says, I enjoy giving and I want you to get that same joy. And then he says, God is able to bless you abundantly. See that? So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you'll abound in every good work. It's like, wow. You mean God is really looking for people who will use their time and their resources wisely so he can pour into them so that they can even be more generous so that he gets the glory from that? You see, there's two different scenarios. God pours into you, you take it all and you hoard it. Or God pours into you and you by faith entrust it to him and to others, and you then get to be a part of this ongoing chain. And it's a simple question to ask. Who's God going to pour resources into more? He's wanting to say, try it in this. And you see how clear it is? So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work that I'm going to pour into you. And the goal of that is so that you can be more fruitful and more productive and more enjoying of this process. And I think what it does is it takes ego out of the equation. It's about God giving it to me, and I'm trying to manage it so that it's honoring to Him, not all about me and what I want to hang on to. And it goes back to those same things I told you. Where does my security come from? Where does my purpose come from? Where does my joy come from? And I'll tell you, money is a very poor source. It's, it's a great source of worry. It's not really a great source of contentment. So here's how we see it working. People come and they, they learn about Jesus and they are just grateful to God for what he's done. And, and they come into our church and we don't take an offering and we don't want money to ever be a barrier to people coming to Jesus. And so sometimes people come for weeks before they figure out, how to put it in an envelope and find the giving box. In fact, I guess my sermon was a success because a guy that came last service just came up and handed me some money. He didn't know what to do with it. So it's like, <laughs> I get the message, Pastor. I have no idea what to do with it. I thought, yeah, I could have mentioned that maybe. But people start with a one-time gift. Usually it's about a heart need or a felt need or something that catches their heart. And then they move to regular giving where you say, okay, when I come, I'm going to, I'm going to, give the Lord some of what I've been given, and then you move to percentage giving. And it's often not 10% to start with, but it's a regular, whether I come to church or not, this is my, like Craig was saying, when I write out my bills, this is the first one I write because this is for God. I don't give him what's left over at the end. I give him the first and the best. And then we hope you can become a generous giver where God pours into you and you're able to give larger percentages as you grow in your discipleship because it is clearly a part of your faith and trust in God. Let me give you another verse here. He says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, God, our source, will supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. God says, I'm going to pour into you, and I'm the one that's giving you these seeds. The money you have are seeds. What are you going to plant in? What are you, in which are you going to plant them, and where are you going to give them? And then he says, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be what? See, I'm not making this stuff up. This is what the Bible says. This is God's plan. 
is that he's going to take care of our needs. He wants to pour into our lives. He wants to enrich us, which is clearly spiritual as well as material. And then he says the purpose is so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Your praise to God, your worship of God will then result in you enabling other people to give praise to God. So he says, come, have fun with us. Let's see this process work. And what are the purposes of God's giving to us? Well, this is a question that really rattled me as we were wrestling with our own giving at one point. Somebody said, why would I give less out of love than I would for law? And I realized that my mindset was, boy, in the New Testament, you don't have to follow the rules so you can just kind of get in in a lower way of percentage. And I thought, what kind of an attitude is that? That here's what God wanted his children to do in the Old Testament. Why do I think, oh, I get a pass. It gets to be easier. Or do I, I have the wrong attitude about it? So here's the challenge is what God does with that, those finances that we give to him. And interestingly enough, the first purpose is the same as the Old Testament. God's purpose is, is that part of the funds that come in through a church should employ people in vocational ministry not to do the ministry, but to recruit and train and encourage and enrich and equip all of us to do the work of the ministry. Just thought like the Levites and priests were to call people to God and to equip them and to teach them, so it provides for spiritual leaders. In fact, Paul says, in the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. That those who are involved in God's work have a right and ability to live, instead of having another job, to live vocationally involved in ministry. He didn't call everybody to that, just as he did in the Old Testament, but there's a group that do that. And then the last purpose is clearly, it's anything that will move God's mission forward. And the mission of God is that more and more people would come to know him. And our church is about people helping people find and follow Jesus. And so, 10% of what Family Church receives, we give to evangelism and to missions around the world. Why? Because the more you give, the more we can give, and we are impacting missionaries all over the world. And it's an exciting process where you begin to see, I'm just part of a chain that God is pouring into me so that I can be part of His purposes. And anything that moves God's purpose down the field is a way for Him to use our funds and we pray and and consider carefully how we use our finances so that it can go for the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of family church or the kingdom of us. So I want you to think about those very specific things. How much do I entrust God? How much do I trust God? How much do I entrust to God? And am I giving in that way that says cheerfully, generously, focused on God's kingdom and not my kingdom. And that's our desire, is that you would just examine those things and let God speak to you. So I'm going to release now to South County and to Green Campus and love you guys. Let me just encourage you to ask these challenging questions. How grateful are you to God for all that He's given you? I don't know about you, but my tendency is to pray about something for a long time, and when God answers, I say thank you once or twice, and then I go on to the next thing. And I believe that God wants us to review what He's done for us spiritually, what He's done for us physically, and to be grateful. Because giving comes out of a sense of gratitude for what God has done and a trust for what God will do. And so, how grateful are you? How does that resonate in you in your own prayer time? And then, of course, the the purpose of this is to cause you to do some evaluation. And And I think you go back to that first thing. Do I trust God for my security? Do I trust God for my purpose in life? Do I trust God for my joy? And if I do, then it's going to be I handle my finances in a different way. And so we just ask you to prayerfully consider what it is that God wants you to do at this stage in your journey, at this stage in your spiritual walk, at this stage in your connection to family church. Let me pray for us together, can I? God, thank you for all that you have given to us. And I know that in my own life, God, I I grew up poor and I didn't even know if I would ever own a house. And you have poured resources into our lives. And now we have a chance to share those with others. 
And it is really fun to be able to give. And I ask, God, that you would give us your perspective, that the things we hold on to are the things we can't keep, and the things that we let go of are the things that last forever. And that you would give us the faith to entrust our stuff to you, to believe that you know what you're doing and that you care about us, and that you want us to participate with you in the generosity that's so, so much of your heart. So, Father, speak to each one of us in the way that we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that, and we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.